roots of Orthodox spirituality. A wondrous journey into Orthodoxy. Prepared and presented by Angeliki Antonaku Lekea. Hello, dear listeners. We are continuing to read from the book Spiritual Awakening, the second volume in the series Spiritual Councils by Saint Paisios. Chapter 3 Where Man Cannot Reach, God Provides Help. God helps with what cannot be achieved by man. What's that smoke over there? We're burning something, Yeroda. You started a fire with such a wind? Yeroda, it rained this morning. Even if it rained and there was a deluge, still, if a strong wind comes, it will dry up everything so much that it can burn like gunpowder. It rained this morning, she says. Some time ago, a fire started down there because of your foolishness. Have you forgotten? If someone makes a fool of himself once, he must then be very careful. God helps wherever he must, where man cannot act by himself. He will not help in our negligence. That way we will make fools even of the saints. Yeronda, do we always know how far we can act without God's help? To begin with, this is obvious. But even if someone has the good will to do what he is capable of doing and doesn't do it because of some obstacle, God will help him at a difficult moment. But if he lacks the will... While having the strength, God will not intervene to help. For example, they tell you to lock the door at night, and you neglect to do it because you are too lazy to walk over to the door. And you think to yourself, God will protect us, after all. This is not a case where you don't lock up because you trust God, but because you are lazy. How then can you expect God to help? You want him to help a lazy person? When I tell someone to lock up and he doesn't, his disobedience alone calls for punishment. Whatever someone can do within his human ability, he should do. And whatever he can't do, he should leave to God. And if he should do a little more than he is able, not out of pride, but out of philotimo, believing that he has not exhausted what is humanly possible, again, God will be moved by this. In order for God to help, he expects to see us make an effort. You see, Noah struggled for 100 years to build the ark. They had to cut the lumber with wooden saws. They used the really hard wood to make saws for the softer wood. Couldn't God have done something to expedite the building of the ark? God instructed them how to build it and then gave them the power to do it. This is why we should do what we can so that God may do whatever we cannot. Someone came to the Kalivi and told me, Why do the monks sit here and not go into the world to help people? If they did go into the world to help people, you would probably ask why they wander around the world. Now that they don't, you ask why not, I told him. 
Then he went on to say, Why do monks have to go to doctors and are not helped by their Christ and their Banaya to get well? That same question was asked of me by a Jewish doctor. I told him, He's not a Jew, offered another man who was with the inquirer. It doesn't matter if he isn't a Jew, I said. What matters is that it's a Jewish question, and I will share with you the answer I gave to the Jewish doctor, since the case is similar. So I told him, As a Jew, you should know the Old Testament well. In Isaiah, it is written that God granted King Hezekiah an additional 15 years of life because he was very good. He sent the prophet Isaiah to tell the king, God grants you 15 more years of life because you destroyed the sacred groves of the pagans. And for your wound, the king had a wound, you should use a tzapella of figs, a bunch of dried figs strung together, and you will be healed. Now, since God granted him 15 more years of life, couldn't he have also healed the wound? But that wound was to be healed with poultice made of dry figs. We should not expect God to do the things we can do for ourselves. We should humble ourselves before our fellow human beings and ask them for their help. Up to a certain point, man must act in a human manner and only after that rely on God. It is egotistical to try to help in something that cannot be done by human means. In many cases where someone insists on helping, I see that it is a matter of temptation to render him useless. When I see that a situation cannot be helped any more by human means, perceiving more or less to what extent man can help, and at what point he must then leave it to God, I raise my hands to God, light two candles, and leave the problem to God, who takes care of it immediately. God knows that I do not do this out of laziness. For this reason, when people ask us for help, we must be discerning and help in whatever way we can. But when we are unable to help in any other way, we should at least help with a prayer, or by turning the matter over to God. For this too is a secret prayer. God always provides for our good. God is kind by nature and always provides for our good. And when we ask Him for something, He will provide it as long as it is for our good. Whatever is necessary for the salvation of our soul and for the maintenance of our physical existence, God will provide it in abundance and will have His blessing. Whatever He deprives us of, either to test us or to protect us, we accept with joy as well as with thoughtfulness as it is for our benefit. God knows when and how to provide for His creation. He helps in His own way at the right time. However, often His weak creation is anxiously impatient because the moment we ask for something, we want to receive it, like a little child who wants the cookie from its mother even before it is baked. We shall ask, we shall be patient, and when it is ready, our good mother, Panagia, will give it to us. Yaroda, when do the saints help? Whenever it is necessary to help, and not when we think it is time to help. In other words, they help when it will be beneficial for us. Do you understand? A child, for example, asks his father for a motorcycle, but the father doesn't buy it. The child then says, I want the motorcycle because I get tired walking to school, to work. Still, the father doesn't buy it because he is afraid of the dangers involved. I will buy you a car later when you grow up, he tells his son. So they put the money in the bank, and when enough money has been saved, and the boy is more mature, they'll buy him a car. In the same way, 
the saints know when they should help us. Yet, Oda, how do we feel God's mercy? God's mercy is the divine consolation that we feel in us. God arranges it so that we cannot be content and at ease in human consolation, and we take refuge in divine consolation. You see, for example, the Greeks in Australia, who found themselves entirely alone there, came closer to God than other emigrants, such as those in Germany, who were closer to their country and found many other Greeks there. The difficulties of life they encountered helped them to anchor themselves to God. They all left with a few belongings. They found themselves far away from their country, far from relatives. They needed to find work, to find a teacher for their children, and so on, without receiving any help from anywhere. This is why they turned to God and held on to their faith. Whereas in Europe, the Greeks didn't have these difficulties, and so don't have this closer relationship with God. Ask, and it shall be given you. Matthew 7, verse 7. Yeronda, since God knows our needs, why must we ask for His help? Because there is freedom, and especially when we have compassion for our neighbor and ask God to help him, God is deeply moved and will then intervene without infringing upon man's free will. God has every good intention to help people who are suffering, but to help them, someone must ask him. For if God helps someone without anyone having made the request, then the devil will complain and say, Why do you help him and infringe upon his free will? He is a sinner. He belongs to me. Here one can see the great and spiritual nobility of God, who does not allow even the devil the right to complain. For God wants us to ask him to intervene and he wants to intervene directly if it is for our good, and to help his creatures according to their needs. God acts separately and specifically for each person, as is best for each. For God and the saints to help someone, he himself must want it and ask for it. Otherwise, they do not intervene. Christ asked the paralytic, would thou be made whole? John 5, verse 6. If man does not want it, God respects that. If someone doesn't want to go to paradise, God doesn't take him, unless he was wronged out of ignorance, in which case he is entitled to divine assistance. Otherwise, God does not want to interfere. Someone asks for help, and God and the saints offer it. In the blink of an eye, they have already offered their help. Sometimes you don't even have the chance to blink. So quick is God to stand beside you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Matthew 7, verse 7. The sacred scripture says, If we do not ask for help from God, we will fall flat on our face. Whereas when we do ask for divine help, Christ will bind us with a rope to His grace and will uphold us. The wind may blow fiercely from all directions, but because we are bound fast, we are not in danger. But when man does not realize that it is Christ who upholds him, he may unbind himself, in which case he will be buffeted left and right and tormented. You must know that only passions and sins are ours. Whatever good we do is from God. Whatever foolish things we do come from us. When God's grace abandons us for just a little while, we become unable to do anything. As in natural life, when God removes oxygen from us, we die immediately. The same is true for spiritual life, if God removes His grace, we are lost. Once I felt a certain gladness during prayer. For hours I stood in prayer, 
and did not feel at all tired. The more I prayed, the more I felt a sweet ease, a delight that I cannot express. Later, a human thought came to me. Because I am missing two ribs and can easily catch colds, I thought of wrapping myself with a shawl to avoid getting cold later. I didn't want to lose the state I was in, but wanted to prolong it as much as possible. As soon as I accepted this thought, I collapsed to the floor. I remained on the floor for half an hour before I could get up and go into the cell to lie down. Before that, while I was in prayer, I felt like a feather, very light, with a delight that cannot be expressed. But as soon as I accepted that human thought, I collapsed. If I had then a proud thought and said, for example, I doubt if there are more than two or three people who are in the spiritual state I am in now, surely I would have suffered serious harm. My thought was a human one, just like that of a lame man who thinks to take his crutches. It was not a demonic thought. It was only a thought of natural reasoning, and you saw what happened to me. The only thing man has is his will, and God helps him according to this will. This is why I say that all the good things we may have are gifts from God. Our works are zero, and our virtues are a long series of zeros. We must try to constantly add zeros and beseech Christ to put a digit at the beginning so that we may become rich. If Christ doesn't put the digit at the beginning, our efforts will be in vain. The grace of God is attracted by humility. Yaronda, I have difficulties in my struggle. Do you ask for help from Jesus Christ, or are you struggling alone? Have you told Christ of your weakness? You don't humble yourself. You don't ask Christ for help, and then you say, I have difficulties in my struggle. When one is humble and asks for help from Christ, he helps. Often man makes an egotistical effort, and this is why he gets no help. Throw your ego out. Don't take it into account, and the grace of God will dwell in you. We wish to acquire sanctity by magic, but if we are in the wrong spiritual state, Christ will not help even if only a minimal amount of selfishness enters into the situation, divine help is obstructed. When I have the desire to be corrected, won't God help me to realize some weakness of mine? For God to help, one must have a desire to struggle. And when we say a desire to struggle, we mean that one must be willing to make some effort to overcome his particular weakness. If God sees even a little true will, He provides abundant help for man. He sends His grace in great abundance. That's how man enters the channel of God. Yaroda, to what extent does God help us in our spiritual struggle? To the extent that we help God to help us. When you ask God for something, and for a long time He doesn't help, you should know that there is pride. If we have passions, for example, gluttony, vain talk, anger, envy, and so forth, and in addition to that we also have pride, God won't help because we are obstructing divine grace with our passions. And even if we have only a tendency to pride in us, we still obstruct God from helping us. Though we may be struggling, and perhaps praying more than is needed. It is out of the question for God not to help someone, unless there is concern that this person will become proud. As soon as the tendency to be proud is dispelled, and man regains his natural spiritual health, then God will deliver him directly from the passion which torments him, and will also reward him for his extra effort in the struggle. For this reason, in order for God to help us, 
we must help God with our humble thought. We should say, Oh my God, I am such a useless person. Please forgive me and help me. Then God helps, because the soul, entrusted into the hands of God with a good and humble disposition, is entitled to divine help. We must believe that Christ and Panagia protect us and help us always, as long as we are of humble mentality. Our God is not deaf, unable to hear us, nor is He blind, unable to see us, as was Baal. Help at the beginning of the spiritual struggle. Yeronda, does God help more at the beginning of the spiritual struggle? Yes. In the first steps of the spiritual life, man receives much help from God, just as parents protect their children when they are small. As the children grow, they are not protected as much because they begin to use their brain. At the beginning of his struggle, man is more aware of the grace of God. Later, God will allow him to struggle and mature on his own. I planted some tomatoes. At first, I watered them every day. After that, I left them for a while. When their leaves started to turn yellow, then I watered them. As long as they were not watered, they were forced to send their roots deep to find moisture in the ground. It was during this same time that they produced the first green fruits. If I had watered them continuously, they would have only grown tall and their roots would have remained near the surface. Yaroda, you said that man, at the beginning of his struggle, is more aware of God's grace, and then for a while he is bereft of divine grace. Yes, God removes his grace for man to be humbled and to appreciate God's help. Isn't this change somewhat painful? No, for God does not abandon man entirely. When man begins to work spiritually, then God gives him, let's say, a chocolate. He then slowly starts to learn to work spiritually, eating a little chocolate from God. But when God does not give him chocolate, and he stops working spiritually, saying to himself, At first I was eating chocolate, but now a terrible thing has happened, and I have none. He will not make any progress. In other words, man must rejoice in this and not complain. We must not seek to have Christ's help readily. Let's not expect special dispensations, because then we will be untrained and unrehearsed in the spiritual life. Even in the army, those who are well trained in the military tactics survive. When someone is constantly helped and assisted, in the end, he is not helped. I am personally moved by the fact that Christ does not help us constantly. I feel as though I am a student, and the professors always place demands on their students and have expectations of them. It is difficult to pass the spiritual examinations. It requires constant vigilance and effort. But then, that is how we progress spiritually. Would it be difficult for God to constantly help everyone? No, but then man would not be really helped in this way. A spoiled child whose parents constantly give him chocolates so he wants them always to be giving him, will become lazy, ill-disposed, and unfortunate. Man, too, will never mature spiritually if he is constantly assisted by God without struggling himself. For this reason, then, God helps man at the beginning of the spiritual life, but then gradually removes himself in order for man to realize that he must do for himself whatever he can. Parents don't always hold a little child by the hand to help it walk. They let it walk by itself for a little and catch it just before it falls. Thus the child learns that its ability is limited to walking by holding on to the handrail. 
If the child only walks when held by the hand, and when they let it go, it doesn't take hold of the handrail to walk, and little by little becomes strong, but instead sits down, then it will never learn to walk, simply because it didn't do what it could. Is a man aware that at first he had divine help, and that later he doesn't? If man doesn't observe himself, he won't be aware of anything. Divine energies are omnipotent. Yeroda, many people are anxious about many things. What will happen with this? What will happen with that? Look, right now, even if God wanted to abandon us, he couldn't. What do you mean, Yeroda? Well, look how parents bring a child into the world. The more they struggle to raise it, the more they love it and are attached to it. God is the same. He brought us into the world. In a way, He struggled to raise us and make us what we are. Now, even if He wanted to leave us, He couldn't, because He is attached to us as long as we continue to have a little filotimo. If we have a little filotimo, we will not lose paradise. Yeroda, you said that the benevolent God will not abandon us. Yes, God never abandons us. We are the ones who forget and abandon Him. When man does not live spiritually, he is not entitled to divine help. But when he does live spiritually and is near God, he is entitled to it. Then, if something happens and he dies, he is ready for the other life, in which case he gains both in this life and in the next. God's help can't be obstructed, neither by men nor demons. Nothing is difficult for God or a saint. The obstacle for us humans is our lack of faith, which prevents the great divine energies from coming to us. And while there is such a great power next to us, we, because there is such a great amount of the human element in us, cannot understand the divine energies which exceed all of the world's human powers, because they are omnipotent. We sit for hours on end in vain, trying by ourselves to find a solution to a problem using all of our inexperience. Our head spins, our eyes burn, sleep escapes us because the little demon has hooked us with obsessive thoughts. We may finally find a solution, but later God finds for us a better solution, which we had not thought of, leaving us with the headaches and the sleepless nights. No matter how right our thought might be, if God is not foremost, the head will tire and ache, while prayer with trust in God brings restfulness. For this reason, we can leave to God those activities which are difficult to achieve by human means and not be dependent upon our human efforts, reassured that He will do what is best. For everything you think of doing, remember to say, God willing, don't let happen to you what happened once to someone I know. He had decided to go to his vineyard to work. He told his wife, Tomorrow morning at first light, I'm going to the vineyard. God willing, you'll go, she told him. God willing or not willing, tomorrow I'm going, he said again. The next day he started out before dawn. In the meantime, on the way to the vineyard, there was such a deluge of rain that he was forced to return home. Dawn had not yet come. He knocked on the door. Who is it? asked his wife from inside. God willing, said he, it's your husband. Dear listeners, our time is up. Thank you for listening. We will continue once again where we left off in our next show. Until then, be well. Let us lift up our Orthodox spirituality.
wondrous journey into orthodoxy. Prepared and presented by Angeliki Antonaku Lekeak.